The aircraft carrier USS John F. Kennedy is more than just a giant war machine. This is a ship that carries the symbolism and heritage of an entire era, hiding hundreds of different advanced technologies under the hood, but most importantly, it radically changes the rules of war on the seas. But still, is there a future for such monumental structures as aircraft carriers in the face of the rapid development of drones, cyber attacks, and hypersonic missiles? Let's figure that out right now. During the Cold War, the United States sought to contain the aggression of the USSR and its allies by surrounding the Sino-Soviet periphery with military bases on all sides. Dozens of large bases were formed in Central Europe, the Middle East, and the Western Pacific. However, soon after the collapse of the USSR, this basing infrastructure was greatly dismantled, and today many nation-states resist the deployment of large U.S. forces onto their territory. Therefore, if America wants to reach out and defeat threats like ISIS or Iran, it has to do so largely from the sea. The value of aircraft carriers in this situation is rather obvious. Boasting acres of deck space, extensive storage space, and deep logistic support, these massive vessels are capable of providing as much sustained strike power against distant enemy targets as a classic land base. The 10 active Nimitz-class aircraft carriers are often referred to as four and a half acres of sovereign U.S. territory. And not without reason. After all, these are the dimensions of the flight deck from which they can launch more than 100 aircraft sorties every day for several months in a row. And since nuclear aircraft carriers have unlimited range, they can be sent to where they're needed in the shortest possible time, operating continuously even without access to bases on land. Over the past decade, U.S. adversaries have done a lot to shape anti-access strategy, which coastal states like China or Iran have adopted to discourage American military presence in areas they seek to escalate. Of course, this approach is dangerous for the U.S. aircraft carrier fleet. However, it's even more dangerous for the American armed forces and their allies operating from ground bases within reach of the aggressors, since the location of these bases is well known and cannot be promptly changed. Aircraft carriers, on the contrary, are not only protected by their own defenses and a strike group of warships, but they're also constantly moving, trying not to stay in their home for too long. With such multi-layered defenses, it's unlikely that any weapons will be able to penetrate this shield. Well, even if it does, it's unlikely to cause irreparable damage. After all, the aircraft carrier itself is equipped with active and passive protection, including thousands of tons of armor to mitigate damage from torpedoes or mines not to mention hundreds of waterproof compartments, so it's almost impossible that anything other than nuclear weapons could sink them. Ford-class aircraft carriers can travel at speeds of 35 miles per hour. That is, if spotted, it could be anywhere in the area of 6,000 square miles within 90 minutes. Since no potential rival has aerial reconnaissance systems capable of continuously tracking aircraft carriers, this nuance poses an extreme targeting challenge for even the most desperate aggressor. In the event of war, the U.S. Navy will move as quickly as possible, thereby weakening any targeting capabilities the enemy has and destroying its over-the-horizon radars on land, as well as UAVs operating close to the carrier strike group. In fact, the air wing of the newest Ford-class aircraft carriers with more than 90 aircraft could quickly undermine the military capabilities of almost any adversary it faces, especially in the context of the widespread introduction of artificial intelligence and the presence of smart weapons that allow you to destroy several targets at once in one flight. Regardless of whether it's ISIS or North Korea, one aircraft carrier with its air wing can deal with more than a thousand enemy targets in just a week, even if land bases in friendly countries have become unusable as a result of enemy attacks. And you don't have to look far for examples. During Operation Desert Storm in 1991, six American aircraft carriers were sent to the Persian Gulf contributing to the air campaign that defeated Saddam Hussein's army before coalition ground forces took over. Ten years later, four U.S. aircraft carriers were deployed at the start of the military campaign in Afghanistan, and when Operation Iraqi Freedom began in 2003, six aircraft carriers were again sent to carry out the assigned tasks. Since then, the Navy's fleet response plan contains a small number of aircraft carriers forward deployed at all times with an additional number ready to surge on short notice in a crisis. 
The newest ships of the Gerald R. Ford class are rightfully considered the most innovative and formidable among American aircraft carriers. The U.S. Navy intends to purchase 10 such vessels to replace the current ones according to the one-for-one -one principle, starting with the lead vessel of the same name, Gerald R. Ford CVN-78, which replaced the Nimitz-class Enterprise CVN-65. Although only five of them are known so far, Gerald R. Ford CVN-78, John F. Kennedy CVN-79, Enterprise CVN-80, Doris Miller CVN-81, as yet unnamed CVN-82. The CVN-78 was a pioneer in its class, so it inevitably faced many challenges along the way from the start of construction in the summer of 2005 to its entry into service in the summer of 2017. CVN-79, aka USS John F. Kennedy, took into account the problems of its successor, trying to smooth out the rough edges and become an even more innovative vessel. But let's not just take my word at face value here. Let's take a closer look at what unites and distinguishes USS Kennedy and USS Ford. Construction of the USS John F. Kennedy began in July of 2011 with the preparation of individual components and the official keel laying ceremony taking place in August 2015 at the Huntington Ingalls Industry Shipyard in Newport News, Virginia. Unlike its predecessor, the construction process of USS Kennedy was characterized by significant use of modular assembly, taking into account previous mistakes. Thus, at the time of launch in 2019, CVN-79 was 70% complete, while CVN-78 was only 50% completed at the time of launch. That is, 70% was assembled in factories, eliminating the need for complex on-site installation. The main reason is advanced digital design where every detail is pre-simulated in a virtual environment. Both ships were equipped with identical A1B nuclear reactors from Bechtel, which replaced the A4W reactors installed in the Nimitz class. These produce about 700 megawatts of thermal energy, or 25% more than A4W, this provides the ship with the additional electrical power it needs to efficiently operate its electromagnetic aircraft launch system EMALS, radar systems, and future weapons like combat lasers that the Navy and Air Force are working together to develop. Moreover, A-1B outperforms A-4W not only in energy production, but also in compactness, which made it possible to free up additional space inside the ship for equipment and simplify the maintenance process. As for the ship's other fundamental systems, namely the Electromagnetic Aircraft Launch System, which replaced steam catapults, and the Advanced Arresting Gear, which is responsible for the safe landing on board even the lightest aircraft of the air wing, after careful testing during operation of the lead ship of the Ford class, engineers were able to identify and eliminate dozens of real and potential issues. This later helped with the installation and configuration of EMOS and AAG on CVN-79, allowing them to optimize their operation and significantly increase the reliability of the systems. Another headache that the U.S. Navy was able to successfully eliminate with the USS Kennedy was the Advanced Weapons Elevators AW. During the construction and testing of the USS Ford, more than just a few took issue with things as they were. Unforeseen technical problems due to the use of new electromagnetic technologies instead of traditional hydraulics, certification delays that affected the overall availability of the CVN-78, and the additional costs of resolving these problems greatly tarnished Ford's reputation. However, the team in charge of the USS Kennedy did their homework. Its optimized designs to improve reliability and ease of maintenance, improve the manufacturing process to reduce production time and cost, and further expanded the use of digital design and simulation to identify and resolve potential equipment problems and conflicts early on. Thus, the newly made super aircraft carrier CVN-79 was able to completely get rid of the childhood problems of its ancestor. One of the key innovations of USS Kennedy was the upgrade of its radar systems. CVN-79 was equipped with a complex and expensive dual-band radar DBR, combining AN-SPY-3 and AN-SPY-4. It was originally developed for the futuristic Zumwalt-class destroyers, but later migrated over and was adapted for the Ford-class supercarriers. However, due to the reduction of the Zumwalt program, the cost of DBR has increased greatly. According to some reports, the price tag for one such radar exceeded $500 million. 
In CVN 79, the DBR was replaced by the Enterprise Air Surveillance Radar, ESER, based on SPY-6 radar technologies. This one will be installed on America-class amphibious assault ships, starting with the LHA-8 and the planned LXR. This decision allowed the U.S. Navy to save approximately $180 million. These funds, according to experts, will be enough for at least a year and a half of the operating cost of the USS Ford. Speaking of money, almost always the lead ship cost the fleet more than its class colleagues. This fate did not spare Ford either. The first class supercarrier cost the U.S. Navy almost $18 billion, of which $12.8 billion was for construction and another $4.7 billion for research and development work. The air wing, or rather its capacity, remained the same for the USS Kennedy as for the USS Ford. Both ships are designed to transport and operate up to 75 aircraft. This number includes Grumman C-2 Greyhound cargo aircraft, Grumman E-2 Hawkeye airborne early warning aircraft, Sikorsky SH-60 Seahawk helicopters, Boeing MQ-25 Stingray drones, Boeing FA-18EF Super Hornet fighter aircraft, and the latest Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II fighters. Granted, due to the integration of the latter, the aircraft carrier encountered force delays. The fact is that USS Kennedy was originally planned for delivery in two stages. The first covered the ship's basic readiness, and the second covered the installation and integration of systems needed to operate the F-35 Lightning II fighter jets. However, in 2020, the U.S. Navy decided to move to a single-stage delivery of the vessel to accelerate its readiness for use with the F-35C in the air wing. First of all, Congress was to blame for this decision, which required, in accordance with Section 124 of the National Defense Authorization Act of 2020, Public Law 11692, the ability to operate the F-35C with CVN-79 even before the completion of post-sea modifications. The second culprit was the eternally haunting American Military Service's time optimization. The move to single-stage delivery allowed the Navy to avoid delays and ensuring more efficient allocation of resources, but at the same time, it smoothly shifted the commissioning of the aircraft carrier from 2024 to 2025. In the end, of course, the Navy won, but you and I can only guess how many sleepless nights awaited all participants in the process. How soon do you think the USS Kennedy will depart on its first mission? Share your guesses in the comments below. And if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell for more content like today's. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.